Today, we are going to be talking Cloak and Dagger and Runaway Season 2. We have a DC News explosion. And Ryan Sands is joining us in studio today. Welcome to Collider Heroes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Do we want to keep that dramatic pause? <laughs> Hello! Hello! Welcome to episode 265 of Collider Heroes. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Amy Dallin. I'm joined by my co-host. Coy Jondro. Hello, and we are joined by Mr. Ryan Sands. What's up, peeps? You know him as Jeffrey Wilder from The Runaways, and we are really excited to talk to you today. Uh, but first, so much news. So much just dropped. Like, we, we knew what we were doing for news. We were ready to go. We were like, this works, and this works, and that lines up. And then DC is like, hey, by the way. Everything changes on Mondays. We got you something. We got you Black Mask uh, has been revealed as the villain of the Birds of Prey movie. The upcoming Kathy Ann directed, Christina Hodson uh, written, Harley Quinn starring Birds of Prey movie, whatever it is, we know. <laughs> we know something more. We know who that girl gang is going after. Um, what do you think? I think Black Mask is one of those villains that I've always wanted to see. I think Blast Ma Black Mask is such a surprise because when I was looking at Birds of Prey, I would not have guessed that was coming. We even talked in the show about the idea that it was a villain we've never seen before that was classic to Batman lore, all these things, and my brain never even like breathed by Black Mask. And then I remember at uh, Las Vegas Comic Con, someone was dressed as Black Mask, and I was like, what an awesome looking villain in 3D. That's such a thing that should be, oh wait, mere weeks later. Mm. So this is very exciting for me. I've always liked that villain. I think that the Birds of Prey against him gives them a lot to do. You can play on their intelligence. You can play on the team needing to rival against him. You can play on so many things, and it's not going to be one note. And most importantly, it's not something that we have a prior association to. There will be no ice, ice like puns. We'll be, we'll be not dealing with Mr. Freeze. I mean, there could be we'll puns. Be, Let's not rule puns. it out. But we're not invested in him from the past. It's a new chapter, and I'm excited about that. Ryan, I know you are an actor, but you're also a comic book fan from way yeah. back. Oh, Got yeah. any thoughts on this one? Yeah, um, I'm a Black Mask fan. It's funny because when I, when I first saw Black Mask as a kid, just initially looking at his design, I'm thinking, okay, he's, he's like a Red Skull ripoff or something. And then a few pages in, it's like, oh, no, this is not Red Skull. This is a <laughs> sadistic um, mob boss here, you know. So I, he's he's always, I've, I've always felt he's just been kind of cool with the with the suits and the, and, the, and that, that mask just looks so creepy. So, yeah, I'm excited to see what he's going to look like in, in live action. It is an interesting choice because he's well known as a general Batman villain, but he also sort of got a lot of his development uh, in Catwoman, uh, in Ed Brubaker's Catwoman, like mm -hmm. the only DC lady who's not in uh, Birds of Prey <laughs> as far as we know. Um, but it makes sense, like, a crime boss is an appropriate sort of target. We had a lot of discussions in the Suicide Squad movie came out about whether it strictly made sense to send them after the world ending threat. and like. A, a target that a Harley and a girl gang can go after, like a criminal conspiracy, that makes sense to me. Yeah. Um, somebody who's messing up Gotham. Although it is a little bit funny that depending on which version of Black Mask they're going with, we have another DC movie where you might be fighting an evil cosmetics company. Ooh, <laughs> another of those to bring it all back. I like this idea. Uh, but uh, that's pr they're probably not going with that original. He's always reminded me of like a Tombstone kind of character, and I always thought Tombstone wasn't taken seriously at Marvel, so I'm excited to see Black Mask get taken seriously at DC. Like the idea of a mob boss, the idea of like organized crime, all these things that I've always wanted Batman to be a detective. I've always wanted Gotham and the DC universe to have specific crime. I feel like they can really world build with this villain, and the idea of world building in DC that doesn't have to tie into other movies, I think they can really do contained. I think, I mean, it's just knowing the villain, but just from knowing the villain, I'm like, oh, world building, establishing a criminal underbelly, like having all of these things, having it be more intelligent, having long form storytelling like just from this villain I'm more excited than I had been and I think that's that's what villain announcements are for it's to shape the story without giving anything away and that's this is perfect for that uh, I do we have any recommended reading I would say Edward Baker's Catwoman and Batman War Games oh I've read uh, War Games I love yeah I loved him in War Games I haven't read Brubaker's Catwoman so that that's now that's on my pull list good stuff I, I really dug his characterization in uh, Under the Red Hood. Mm. Yeah, just I thought that was fun. He was you know just hitting his, his henchmen and, and knocking them out. I mean, he was it was it was a fun depiction. So that's so th your those are your three. <laughs> and I got to read yeah. Brubaker. Mm. So I also need to talk about in the world of DC. We are getting and this completely came out of nowhere. I didn't even think it was rumored. I don't think anybody was talking about it. Like I hadn't heard any rumblings. Supergirl's getting a movie. What? Supergirl is getting a feature film from DC. They're, they announced it the week after Comic-Con. So Comic-Con's <laughs> over, they're like, you know what? It got a little quiet. Let's go ahead and drop this giant bomb of knowledge. Supergirl's getting a movie. I love Supergirl. I think it's a really great move. Uh, the Oren Uziel is working on the script for DC. 
I wonder what that means for Man of Steel 2, which has been the thing I've been wanting them to announce for five years. I wonder what it means for this whole Bat family they're doing going forward. I wonder what it means for, are we getting more of a Superman-leaning universe, or does that mean we're getting less Henry Cavill? Like, I want to know if this is more or less Henry Cavill, because after MI6, I want more. Uh, so I think Supergirl's a great move because I think it's a really strong character. I think that after the success that is coming with Captain Marvel, after the success they've already had with Wonder Woman, having a strong female character that isn't just one, having multiple in a universe is a, a thing no, you they, can do. No, we're Highlanders. There can only be one. <laughs> there's just one. We got one. Look at these team of men and there's that girl over there. I'm so excited we're getting Supergirl because that means we can start to build. So for me, this was my biggest announcement of the week is that we're getting a Supergirl movie. She's always been one of my favorite characters. I love that it's like the cousin of Superman, like that thin writing of like, yeah, it's my cousin. And then like this is this great character like sure the planet died but she's fine like there's just and there's the pod scene in man of steel there was that pod that was open so you've already laid the groundwork you've already got the origin story it's already right there i'm really excited what do you think uh, well i'm thrilled i mean i'm confused but i'm thrilled <laughs> like because we've we've had so many discussions about the dc slate of films and what was coming and what wasn't coming and what had been announced and was coming onto the slate and falling off the slate but like I don't care. I'm just happy. <laughs> what, whatever it like, whatever led to them deciding, yes, now is the time. Let's make a Supergirl movie. Uh, I'm I'm excited to see it. I'm yeah. not familiar with the screenwriter, so I don't have much to go on except that like DC's putting some money behind Supergirl. We already it's going to be a, a casting challenge, just yes. like yes. they faced with yes. Flash, because yes. you have a perfect one already. The, the beloved show is definitely going to be a tricky thing. Like Grant Gustin is a lot of people's Flash. She Melissa's a lot of people's Supergirl. So where do you go from there? Like the bar is so high, and you've had a lot of long form television that's a lot of investment in a character where do you go uh, what do you think about Supergirl getting a movie yeah well it's I, I agree with Amy it's it's tough to imagine where they're going to go with casting because for me you know Melissa kills it yeah you know, as as Supergirl like it's unreasonably she, good yeah it's been a long time since Helen Slater and, and we had <laughs> we had Supergirl a little bit you know in in, in Smallville um, but like this this Supergirl with the S on her chest, um, Melissa has truly made that hers, you know, in, in a very real way, and and she does such a great job. It's like, wow, um, how where do you, you go? How, from yeah, <laughs> yeah, where do you go, and how do you, you know, define this this character on the uh, on the big screen? Because it seems like she's so perfectly embodied um, on on TV. But I'm I'm interested, man. I'm I'm very curious. There's no chance this is straight up a Melissa Benoist movie, right? Can like you that imagine? Makes, yeah. It makes no sense from a production <laughs> standpoint. Finally, but like, Infinity Crisis and just start smashing worlds <laughs> together. Like she, the movie just opens and it's her with like Ben Affleck, and Ben Affleck's leaving as Batman. So like this is his last chance. They just start just like ah. I oh would my love God. that. Imagine Melissa Benoist holding Ben Affleck in her arms, <laughs> a la Ooh, Superman and Supergirl wow. in Crisis on Infinite Earths. Yeah. Yes. That's an image none of us yes. would ever forget. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, Crisis of Infinite. I said Infinity Crisis. Crisis of Infinite Earths is the most ripe opportunity. I think that over. Flashpoint. You, can't, I, you need 40 years of DC before you can do... Well, I guess we've had... I don't know. Tell that to Flashpoint that's apparently moving forward. They're just making moves. Let's see what happens. I just want them to do Supergirl justice, and I love the idea of them bringing the TV into it. Like, because everyone <laughs> has been wanting Grant Gustin. With Flashpoint, you can have both. That'd be so cool. <laughs> It's never going to happen, but I it'd be so cool. The version that they do, I'm excited to see. I'm excited to see what, where they go with it. Uh, and like, honor to DC, this will be their second Supergirl movie because they tried it. Uh, and, and just as a side note, I know this won't happen because it doesn't make any sense, but it is an astonishing coincidence that Wonder Woman is set the year the Supergirl movie came out. And if they can like make some oh, little man. Easter egg to like some cool hit movie about a flying girl, like yes, maybe please. inspired by the reappearance <laughs> of Wonder Woman on the scene, I will die in the theater. Teen uh, Titans is so Easter egg heavy and so self-aware and such a great lightness for DC. Uh, have you gotten to see it? Not yet. It, I saw it last night because I was mm. like, I, last week we didn't get to cover it on the show and all week I've been trying to see it and I've been dealing with movie pass looking at you oh, movie no. pass so I finally got to see it yesterday and it is such a breath of fresh air because all the characters are authentic to their teen titansness but it's also the movie has so much fun with how many superhero movies there are the movie is very aware that Deadpool exists the movie is very aware like there's some cameos in there you would not expect that were legally an option to do there's a <laughs> lot of like oh they signed off on that did they this movie is so much fun so if you get a chance to see teen titans it is a it gives me a lot of hope that they would do something as weird as having Wonder Woman featured uh, maybe going to see Supergirl because teen titans goes there and then some and it's we gotta we gotta give a shout out to like the dc currently has a movie in theaters that's at like 90 yes. percent on rotten tomatoes it's doing uh -huh. incredibly and i went to it uh last night at 6 50 on a on a tuesday 
and it was sold out. Like I got the last two seats on a Tuesday night at AMC. So like people are seeing it. The audience was so excited. There were little kids quoting it, like doing that thing where just like a joke was funny. So they repeated it the rest of the movie. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, they're getting their Robin. This is amazing. <laughs> so it was really cool to see with that audience. So I recommend everyone see Teen Titans as soon as you can. So that's not all that's coming from DC. We also have a big update to what we talked about last week when we were responding to rumors that the Matt Reeves Batman might be based on year one, mm -hmm. which as it turns out, Nope. Completely wrong. <laughs> Matt Reeves has said he's close to finishing the script. Uh, it should be done in the next couple weeks. Uh, but he says it's not based on Batman Year One. He describes it as a noirish detective thing that's about Gotham. So I could see where maybe someone talking about that would be like, oh, it's a back to basics, but it's not an origin story. And he says Ben Affleck is still involved. Although according to the, I want to say, Deadline Hollywood article, uh, they, he didn't clarify in what he said it was too soon to say in what capacity for whatever that means. Okay. But we have some some solid news and it's what a lot of us were hoping for, like a very world's greatest detective story about Batman and about Gotham. What do y'all yeah. think? I mean, I, I want to see prisoners of Batman. Like, I want to see someone hunting someone down. I want to see a detective. I want to see the smartest guy in DC. I want to see a man driven to the edge by the loss of his parents that has like, leaned into intelligence and gone hunting for vengeance in his broken city. I feel like we've gotten a lot of different Batmans over the years. We've had an incredible run with Chris Nolan's Batman. We've had some really special stuff with Michael Keaton. We've had, I like Batfleck. I really do. But we've never had the detective Batman. So I would really like to see, for the first time, in my opinion, the animated series. Like, I'd like to see something of that ilk. I want to see Batman be so smart that he figures out how to take out the entire Justice League as a human being. I've never seen a Batman on screen yet that looks like or acts like he could take out the entire Justice League because he's the smartest guy. So for me, Batman is uh, leaning into intelligence, and I think it's our responsibility as adults to show kids that being smart is a superpower. I think it's our responsibility to go, this man isn't just the power of money, which is a great joke in the Lego movie, but he's actually a smart guy that makes what he has a benefit, not just being... You you know, this this crazy person. So I'm really excited for this description, meaning we'll not only get a noir, which I think is the genre we haven't really seen yet in a superhero movie, Logan was a Western noir, but we haven't seen like a noir noir, plus the intelligence of a detective story, that's my Batman, I want that. Yeah, um, I don't think I could say it better than you just did, um, but I think what's, what's really cool about it is that, um, this is something that is as different as it is like in, in, in a live action movie, you know, to see this side of Batman, but it's like undeniably always been a part of his character. Mm. This is something that, you know, it's not taking him into some weird direction that is going to cause a lot of, you know, a lot of dispute and everything like this is something that has always been at the core of Batman and to, to really get to, to focus in on that. Is something new that we haven't really seen on screen before. So I'm I'm looking forward to it, and uh, it absolutely is a part of Batman that I've missed. In um, you know, yeah, that that Batman that's always that that's got that's like ten steps ahead of you. That is going to do that, do all of that homework, and not necessarily always just lean on Lucius mm -hmm. um, or you know or, or or Alfred or somebody else. Like you know, he's like this is Sherlock Holmes in a cape. Yeah, you know, yeah. and uh, so I'm I'm looking forward to it. Sherlock Holmes in the cape is now an image that will be looking for the foreseeable future. Takes off the hat yeah, and has bad little, little holes. In, yeah, yeah, perfect. And he teamed up with Sherlock Holmes in the comics. Yeah. There was that whole, there was that whole situation we could get. You know, another weird Infinity Crisis, Crisis and Infinite situation. I want it. I want that weird stuff. I will say while we're talking about the smart heroes, this is like I'm, I'm actually getting just sort of in spite of myself, really excited for the Birds of Prey movie. But it is still baffling to me that it is not the team Oracle founded because that's something she brings to the table so much. Yeah. It's like you can be a badass in several different ways. Anyway, we've got more news so much news so much went down can i take this next one you got this one we have a batwoman <laughs> We have a freaking casting for Batwoman in the Arrowverse on DC TV, uh, and it is Ruby Rose. And it's legit. It's been confirmed. It's not a rumor. I just I refreshed about 30 times to see what was legit because of the internet and the way it works. Ruby Rose is Batwoman, and from the day's beginning to day's end, it went from guesting, appearing, to maybe getting her own show in the near future. Like, it evolved throughout the well, news had, cycle. They had announced that they were working on a show. They mm -hmm. had some execs working on it. They have a writer attached, I think. Uh, one of the execs is from Vampire Diaries, um, and they'd been talking a little about their process and their thinking for this show. Um, I'm not super familiar with Ruby Rose's work. I will say, like, physically, I think she's a great match. Like, it's, it's still CW casting, but, like, she looks right to me. Uh, what do y'all think? I think she's impossibly captivating. Uh, <laughs> I think there's something about Ruby Rose that when she's on screen, you're like, 
okay, you could read the dictionary, but I'm listening to what you have to say because she's just very intense in a way that isn't playing intense. She just has a, a, a ness, for lack of a better word. And she also brings a very specific audience. Uh, she is actually representing her community, which I really appreciate. I also love that they cast someone that wasn't someone that's carried 10 movies before. They cast someone that's more true to the character if that is the way they're taking the character. So I'm excited for Ruby Rose as Batwoman, but I haven't seen her in a role to date that is Batwoman. Does that make sense? Mm. Like, I'm excited about the casting and the character separately. You but didn't catch her on the other Jewish lesbian superhero? <laughs> yeah, I'm like, you know, I've been looking for that movie, but it hasn't popped up in my Netflix queue yet as recommended, but I've been looking. I mean, it's a whole genre. But it's well too, plumb. like, she's very, like, she's stoic, and she's, like, very min minimal words, and, like, Oracle slash Batwoman speaks. Like, there's a lot of, like, roles where she's been, like, the badass that looks into the middle distance. That woman to me is is really smart and well spoken. So I'd like to see what she does beyond that very specific subgenre. It is funny though, because Kate Kane is pretty emo. If you read which you should, Batwoman Elegy by Greg Rucka and J. H. Williams, the the story arc that first fleshed her out in her own solo stories, one of the greatest comics I have ever read, like bar none. Um, you will you will get familiar with like the moody glance is not foreign. To I don't want that. I want what that sort of mouth. Well, uh, DC has been like kind of killing it on TV, so the the track record is there. So you know, I'm optimistic. Um, I haven't seen a lot of her work. I was watching her on Orange Is the New Black before I had uh, it spoiled for me, and I bailed. Oh, no. So, um, <laughs> and I don't know if you know, there's a lot of things to watch now. So I kind of yeah, haven't a lot out there. found my way back. But uh, you know, the track record is there. So. We'll see. They've, they've, they've made a lot of picks that turned out amazing. Yeah, and most yeah. of them were people I wasn't familiar with beforehand. Mm -hmm. So, fingers crossed. Do we think we'll get this iteration of the costume? Do you think we'll get the one that was like the, the, the leather, very intense with the sewn mouth? Do you think? I think you're thinking Cass Kane's back. Oh, I am! That's mm -hmm. what was throwing me off. Who I'm might like, that be in Birds of Prey? Much. Who might be in Birds of Prey? I'm going to get so much crap on the internet for that, but I love no. that suit so much. There's a lot of bad people. There's a lot of bad people, and I'm ready for all of them. <laughs> I think this one with the, the red wig and, and the, the, like, some version, some, some TV CW version of this, I think, I hope, is what we're going to get. Yeah, that's a good look. And I'm ready for a show. I'm ready for a bat show. Like, I really appreciate Arrow, Flash, all those things. I want to see what I had assumed Gotham was going to be. I want to see this next iteration, yeah. like, that, like a bat person on a TV show that's just, like, so badass and awesome. And Ruby Rose is so yeah. badass and awesome. Yeah. So I, Arrow, I'm excited for that. Arrow's kind of giving you a little... little taste of bat. Batman-ishness. It's, it's pretty <laughs> little, Yeah. You know, that first uh, season is super Gotham-y. Yeah. Like, yeah, that, yeah. that's a very Batman season, mm -hmm. especially his origin being so, like, that lines up pretty well. But this Batwoman... I'm, I, it'll be a different thing. I'm so excited. So also in the world of television, there's a little show called Cloak and Dagger. Uh, it did extremely well. It just had a finale. I am a big fan of Cloak and Dagger. I was really impressed with, to just, to give credit to costume design, because uh, it's a very tricky thing, and we as internet geeks are very loud about things working or not working, so I want to give credit when something really, really, really worked. Cloak's cloak should not have worked on screen. <laughs> cloak is a guy that wears a giant billowy cloak that shouldn't really translate, and they gave it not only a backstory, they made it emotionally relevant, and they tied it into the hometown of the show. That's like, they, they had, there was a better origin story for his cloak than most superheroes get. <laughs> so I want to give credit to that cloak because the lines on it looked just like the art from Maximum Carnage. Yeah. The way it shaped around his suit didn't make it like this, this shapeless figure. It gave him more personality, and when he put that hood up if you're a comic fan at all you were like oh, 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 oh. so i just gotta say cloaks cloak incredible dagger those daggers looked exactly like when i was a kid and i thought that would be what it is the personification of both tandy and uh tyrone was exactly how i never realized i wanted an origin story like I, I think of them as adults i didn't know i needed them as kids but that's exactly how like oh this is how they get to this point like i didn't know i wanted that but here we are and the finale doing such a great job of like kind of inverting things from the first episode i thought was brilliant storytelling long form storytelling i really recommend cloak and dagger and freeform this is a great way to come out swinging it was much more adult than i expected there was drug use there was sex teenagers were treated like adults it didn't like pander to kids or to adults it was very responsible much like another show runaways we'll talk about i love cloak and dagger so Cloak and Dagger thoughts. Yeah, it was very exciting the way the finale this week. Um, I, I, I just dived in recently, and it's so compelling. It captures the thing that I've always loved about the characters most, which is this sense that like they're just tied together 
Like, your mileage may vary on the exact nature of the mm -hmm. tie, and their mileage over the year has varied on, like, what it is that makes them right for each other. But, like, that sequence in the first episode where you first see them as teens, and they're just so lost, but you're watching them back to back, and they're communicating through film the sense that these two kind of aren't right without each other. Yeah. Like, and I love that, because that's part of the, the mythology of those characters. That's part of the iconography of those characters. Uh, I, can you legally comment on this <laughs> excellent show? Yeah, yeah. I believe I could say that I really like it. <laughs> um, no, you know, to, to kind of echo, uh, again, Coy's sentiments uh, about the, the cloak and, and use the word storytelling, and that is what, what I really enjoy just about, about all of this stuff that we've been talking about. I really dig how the stuff that has existed for so many years is now being um, reinterpreted for a 2018 sensibility. Um, sure, some things have to change, mm. but um, but there are also some things that um, that really change and change for the for the better because they they can be um, they can add a little more depth to it. Like like that cloak, it made so much sense um, as to to the origin of this thing and the the emotional significance and, and resonance of what that cloak meant and what it meant to Tyrone to 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 wear it. Um, I just I, I enjoy the fact that that you know these aren't just two two teenagers that just met each other and fell in love and I need you and you need me. No, there was this more depth to it, just like our real life relationships <laughs> that, that we all have. So um, I was uh, happy to go along for the ride with characters that I always I knew who they were, um, you know, because they popped up in in you know. Uh, I've been, you know, reading comics for a minute, so you know. I, I, but I don't think I ever really followed a, a full cloak and dagger arc, so mm. my familiarity with them wasn't as um, as deep as, as it was with a lot of other characters. So it was just really cool being introduced to them in this way. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm congrats to them on, on getting a second season. And uh, yeah, I'm. I'm I'm there, I'm there for it. It was really nice to see a version that did feel very different, but also had that, like, the first time Tandy crawled into that church, I was, like, yeah. out of my yeah. chair. Yeah, yeah. I was like, that's the church. It's not in New York, but I like this. And, like, their choice of setting is interesting. Their choice of character is interesting. And like you said, they're coming back for a season two, along with a Another certain other show. What? That what, also what might show? feature Cloak and Dagger at times in the comic books. Uh, what are you guys talking about? There's these kids, <laughs> and, and they run away. They don't and, stay home. Uh, <laughs> runaways, man. I, I have been... Uh, Preaching the Runaways as I think a new bar in not just comic shows but in young adult shows. Runaways was the first show for me as a approaching thirty-year-old man where I was like, "Oh, I'm identifying with the parents." Oh no, uh, <laughs> because the show was written so well that you're invested in the parents and the Runaways. The show actually for me, I'm a giant Brian K. Vaughn fan. But for me, it fleshed out the parents more than the book could because of the way it was written, the way it was presented. I never expected Runaways to give me things the book didn't because of how big of a BKV fan I am. So when the show was that good, much less took its time, made you invest in 12 leads, and not only 12 leads, a dinosaur? When Old Lace pops up and you're like, yeah, I believe it. Yes. Like I, So few movies or TV shows are so good and so down to earth, you're like, yeah, there's a dinosaur now. <laughs> this show does 12 leads and is a comic show and has multiple years of investment and is based off a great book and it old lace works like runaways i love it thank you thank you yeah it's a it's a crazy ride we're we're shooting episode two i'm sorry uh season two now um we're almost done so um we don't i don't think we have a release date just yet as of right now but um looking like winter of this year so yeah man it's it's a, it's such a cool ride as someone who you know, lived uh, comics forever. You know, this is, it's just crazy to be a part of it. And I'm, again, storytelling. I'm really digging where we're going, new places, new faces. So, uh, yeah. This yeah. is our interested face. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Go on. Say. And these things you're not allowed to talk about, yeah. huh? <laughs> no scoops. So, what, what was cool for me is uh, you and I know each other through my other show, and you are such a diehard comic fan that you watch these type presentations. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. you heard me mention how much I like Runaways on Marvel Movie News, and I love that you are a person that watches Marvel and reads the comics, and you're invested, and you know the material. You get to bring a depth to a character that's from the material you love, add more to it, and then grow from there. What's it like as an actor to know that you're doing more for a 2D character than anyone ever thought possible? Oh, man. I never really, really thought about it like that. Wow, Coy. <laughs> no pressure. No pressure. Um, you know, as so basically, 
when when Runaways come out and it came out um, the the comic, you know, I, I was talking to Amy about it earlier, mm-hmm. and um, uh, I've talked about this before, but. I wasn't really reading as much around that time. You know, I was a broke college student, you know, and, and thinking, daydreaming about being an actor. Um, and so when I got the audition and realized that this is what I was auditioning for, that Runaways thing, and I went back just to try to familiarize myself with it a bit, and I ended up just getting hooked and reading <laughs> the whole thing. And then I'm in my head like, oh, wait, 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 wait. I don't want to necessarily try to um, imitate Brian K. Vaughn's voice in my audition. You know, I gotta, I gotta interpret this this material as I see fit and as my showrunners have described this guy, which is a little different yeah. than than the comic. So um, it's actually as much as I was looking forward to just playing this this villain and this this guy that um, is. It sounds weird to say I was looking forward to playing a guy that sacrifices teenagers, but it is what it is. <laughs> Uh, as an artist, it would be interesting to go in that place. But to play this guy that's that's a lot more nuanced, um, that that you you kind of get to see behind the curtain or the behind the red robe, um, <laughs> why he's doing what he's doing, um, what he how he feels about what he's doing, how he feels about everybody else. You know, it's it's a lot more interesting, a lot more fun. So, man, I'm I'm really like living a dream right now because I love all, you know my castmates. We all get along great um, you know f- for so many you said 12 it's actually like 16 17 of us really yeah, there's you know, 12 parents. all the parents that's true 12 parents yeah, well, that's 10 I, yeah. to 12 10 to 12 <laughs> yeah <laughs> and you know the, the the recurring you know faces that we have and and miss uh, miss old lace um, yeah it's a lot it's yeah. a big, it's a big show it's a big undertaking whenever we all get together and, and do those group scenes but it's it's a fun ride man and it's a testament to the cast that you're invested in both the young and the parents and yeah. you're invested in each of them for different reasons yeah. and I love like I love what Greg's done with the character because that character in the comics is just not right. something you can really care yeah. about like yeah. you're not really invested in him until he gets his gauntlets mm-hmm. like you're not there until then and then he makes some work and I love the characterization of the parents being not just you know mustache twirling right, right. and it's i'm really excited for season two because now uh, a spoiler light spoiler for a show that ended about four months ago uh <laughs> they have run away mm. so it's we actually have a quote josh schwartz says it's going to accelerate we're now running with our kids we are now into that part of the story and that part of the adventure the focus shifts now to these kids trying to survive on the streets and they're mm-hmm. kids from brentwood they are not really used to living on the streets of los <laughs> right, angeles right. and he promised more of the kids using their powers and we'll have a reference that's late in the season that will probably be our first real breadcrumb that connects to the MCU. You. Yeah, we Scoops. just we Scoops. just I mean, it's from the article, but oh, yeah. scoops if you follow up. Yeah. So, I I'll, I'll say this. So, when I get the scripts, um I'm generally just like swiping through and finding the uh the wilder stuff, right? <laughs> because I'm a fan of this stuff and I like hearing it out loud at our table reads, you know, read by the actors. So, I I kind I dig that, right? So, I completely miss that that little reference until we're at the table read and it comes up. <laughs> I'm like, oh, wow, I used to just say that. <laughs> and it's already known that I'm like the nerd on set. So, you know, people just looking at me like, okay, Ryan, you happy? Like, He's yes, excited. I'm happy. Yes, I'm very happy. Yeah, yeah, it's... It's all connected. I mean, That's the first it time, it's such, a, it's such a geeky show that doesn't treat itself as a geeky show. Like, the first time the Fistagons came up, it was a moment for the show, but it was twice a moment for comic fans. Yeah, and, like, yeah. w- when you see those things happen, I can't imagine reading a script and being like, oh, they're using that. That's not even a real word. Oh, that's coming. Yeah. So I'm but really they nailed excited. it because, in context, they made it a character moment with Chase and his dad, which and you have super it. complicated mm-hmm. feelings about. And also, if you already know Chase from the comics, you're freaking out. Yeah. So season two, uh, without uh, doing anything that, that I know the Marvel snipers, uh, do you <laughs> do you think that w- what you've experienced so far, are you excited about loving the comics and like, where it's progressing and the, like the, the pacing and all the things that this little quote alluded to? Does it feel like does season two feel like a different season? Does it feel like you know an advance? Absolutely, yeah. Because it, it starts off with a bang, and and because of the faces and places that I alluded to these are these are like kind of iconic um, in, in this in this runaways world um, so I, I can't wait to, to see how how the fans react when when these these things are, are introduced because one thing I, I will say like you know man I, okay I sound so biased but I really 
dig like what our art department is doing, what our what our writers are doing, mm. the, you know, the the vision because as a fan taking taking this stuff that that we've loved for years that has worked for years and and taking it and just just reintroducing it like you said with those fistigons. No, they're not some simple little, you know, thing that he pulls out and and we all <laughs> are happy about. No, this is something that was special between these two characters that that um, kind of illustrate where that that family drama was. So everything that's introduced, it's not just it's not just a, 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 an Easter egg. It's not just a little reference. These are things that explain this world a little bit more. Explain who these characters are and their relationship um, uh, with each other. So yeah, man, I'm, I can't wait to to to. You know, see what the reception is going to be like. And congrats on Freeform. Congrats Thank on that. You. That's yeah. like uh, going from internet to network television is a yeah. beautiful thing. I don't know what all that means. I mean, we <laughs> we we had you know our our, our season one premiere air after uh, Cloak and Dagger's finale. I don't know what that means moving forward. Um, you guys but out there it, might, might have in some history. more info. Hopefully it turns yeah. into more things, yeah. but either way. It's nice yeah. to see them taking advantage of the fact that it should be all in the family, right. not to run away sit up here. And yeah. and there's a certain you know precedent in the comics that those things should tie together. Whether or not that is what happens, I'm it's gonna, really cool to go like, here's two hours of, oh, ooh, I know what this means. I'm going to put my, my, my nerd hat on and be like, it'll be really interesting if that happens because Cloak and Dagger's role in Runaways is very much as the people who've been at this for years. Yeah. And that's obviously going to be different. They're not going to be the ones being like, we remember being teen dummies. They're going to be like, we are literally teen dummies. We are also Let's all figure this runaways out. <laughs> yeah. in this world. And the, uh, what we were talking about before the show, the world they built is a lot like that yes. Netflix thing, but over here, like Netflix feels like one universe, this feels like one universe. When I was watching Cloak and Dagger, it felt like the runaways could be doing things just off yeah. camera. Yeah, and the, I really like that. The tone is, is similar. The, the way that it's shot is is very similar. Mm. So yeah, just it just makes sense. Let's do it. Let's <laughs> yeah. Do it. Yeah. There's our scoop. Ryan Sands <laughs> wants that thing we all want from the comics. So we've got some uh, minor mutations to go through. A lot of news broke this week and here are some of the minor mutations. We've got the excitement of Daredevil season 3 is coming this year. Are we going to go through the images? Yes, yeah, so Daredevil Season 3 is happening this year. What else we got? Uh, an indie graphic novel that I adore called Prince of Cats by Ron Wimberly has been optioned by Legendary as a vehicle for Lakeith Stanfield. Who I love, by the way, just mm -hmm. tangently. Oh, we're uh, going to get We've also it. got Black Panther has crossed $700 million domestically. Wow. Black Panther, the third film in history to do that domestic. That is so much money. We'll talk about that. We've got some details about FX's Why the Last Man series, like it's just called Why. Ampersand the Monkey is mostly CGI, and it is set a minute into the future. I hope the monkey be friends. And we also got news that Craven the Hunter is getting a solo film because Sony is just like, hey, I've heard of this Steve Ditko guy. What if we just green light a lot of movies about things he drew? So we'll see what that means. And Deadpool, I'm sorry to interrupt because Deadpool, we know the secret of why the animated didn't happen. And Deadpool, there's some, we'll have some words about Deadpool soon. <laughs> Uh, we do. We have a, a little more DC news. We got uh, some piece of Joker casting with Mark Marin. We got an Aquaman producer who says their intention is that Black Manta will play a very large role in the DC universe. And we have a start date for the Flash movie next February 2019. We also have some news with Todd McFarlane and his Venom thoughts. I love the, like, the world of crossover between artist and material. And you have an exciting one with Eclipse, right? Yeah, and another option announcement. Skybound has an indie comic called Eclipse, a sci-fi one that just got optioned for television. And finally, Wolverine is getting the weirdest claws he's ever had. And I'm very curious what and why, and I have a lot of question marks bouncing around my noggin. And you're in our world now, so that constitutes news. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, any of those that leapt out to you as our guest, what was the a minor mutation that was most like, huh? Maybe the first one, Daredevil. I'm I'm a huge Daredevil fan. You know the the show that kind of, that kicked it off, kicked off the, uh, you know the the Netflix universe. Um, I really love what what Charlie Cox has has done with that character. Um, so yeah, man, I'm, I'm I loved um, season two and and the introduction of the Punisher and having them to um, play each other, uh, play against each other, and now. Um, 
what is it? Um, man, man. Um, born again. Born again. Born again. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Born again. Now being being a part of of this new season, I'm I can't wait. And that means we have four Netflix series this year. And if that's the new precedent, one a season. Wow. That's insane. We'll have all of the all of the team effectively represented throughout the year. And we just had Punisher to close this out seasons. last year. That's With the four seasons. <laughs> so I love that we had all the defenders get their share of the year because we just had Luke Cage. Iron Fist is coming up in the fall. In the winter, I assume is when Daredevil is going to drop because it's this year. That's incredible. Incredible. Jessica Jones started the year off like what? Okay, they should definitely make it the four seasons and then we can just start crafting holidays around them and it'll be it. like happy Jessica Jones miss. The Catholic I got you guilt of Daredevil totally plays yeah. at Christmas. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> So I think Daredevil happening uh, this year is really exciting because I'm, I'm really excited for that story. I want to see Bullseye. I really hope that's what we get this season. I feel like they've done a really good job escalating from one to two. I'm excited to see what two to three looks like mm -hmm. since Daredevil kicked us off. Yeah. Uh, okay, I got to talk about Prince of Cats, mostly because I want to see if I can explain Prince of Cats on the internet. <laughs> it is a graphic novel written and drawn by Ron Wimberly. Uh, it is a 1980s New York City hip-hop Shakespeare comic book retelling Romeo and Juliet from the perspective of Tybalt, but everybody fights using Japanese swords. Wow. That's so many things. And they're making a movie! <laughs> with, wow. With Lega Stanfield. Yeah. Like he's attached. Uh, apparently, the, there was an announcement, full disclosure, I work for a tiny arm of Legendary, but we have nothing to do with this, so this was like, uh, came, as, <laughs> yeah. uh, came as a massive, unhappy surprise to me. Um, they've got, uh, I want to say, Selwyn Sifu Hines, who's been uh, attached to work on the script, who uh, I don't know from any existing work, but he's working on the Who Fears Death, which is a fantasy adaptation for TV, so I've seen his name pop up a little bit. Um, and it's, it's great, like Tybalt in Romeo and Juliet, is kind of the bad guy, but he's also known as Prince of Cats. And it's about like the mood of this world and the look of this world and this incredibly out there but incredibly compelling vision that Ron Wimberly has. Uh, they came out initially from Vertigo. You can now get the image edition. It was out of print for a couple years, that's which really sucked. Cool. <laughs> uh, that's, I'm a retailer, so I was just like, read Prince of Cats, just kidding, you can't. Find it later. Um, so it's back now. You should definitely read it. You should check it out. You should get excited and see how the heck they're gonna do this. And if you're not watching Atlanta, shame on you, watch Atlanta. Also, sorry to bother you, Leggett Stanfield is one of the most powerful up and coming actors. Yeah. So anything he's attached to him in, much less a Shakespearean cat adaptation from a comic, like you don't like, what? And he's not literally a cat. He's just, the Prince of Cats is, is Tybalt's like I, title. I, I, but I think know, he's gonna be a cat. You never know, you I've might be. I've decided. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's incredible. I love watching him work. I mean, he's always doing something interesting and unexpected. So. Yeah having him be a part of a very interesting and <laughs> unexpected, uh, unique project like that, yeah, it's like perfect. But that's what I love about comics. It's one person's weird, beautiful, specific yeah. vision that like, it just wouldn't exist without this. And then for, for the artists to come in and be like, yes, let's make, let's, I, I'm so happy for everybody involved. Yeah, um, so we won't be able to get through all the minor mutations, but we'll breeze through like the brief news of $700 million just needs to be shouted out wow. and loved. Three movies have ever done this. Avatar, you might have heard of it. Force Awakens, people waited some decades for real Star Wars movies. And sorry, Mark. And then at the end, we get Black Panther, the first solo film to even get close to this number, much less this character. We knew this was gonna be a movement. We knew it would be important, but 700 million, which means it's made almost one and a half billion worldwide, because it made 634 international. This thing has made almost one and a half billion dollars just thank you, just wow. in general. Thanks comic fans, thanks movie fans. I'm so glad this exists. And even beyond the uh, Oscar announcement this morning of the popular film Oscar, mm. implying that- What does that mean? Implying that the movies that are Oscar winners aren't popular or implying that it's more lean and it's silly. But I think Black Panther will get love both in the popular category and the best picture and director and oh, actor category. If they invented that category so they can get out of nominating Black Panther that's for what best I picture, think. I'm gonna be mad. I think wow. that's the- Brooke is pointing yeah. at me. Oh, I oh. Think I, that's why they did it. Yeah, mm. I'm not so happy the Academy's in announcement this morning. Yeah. Uh, it's only going to be three hours. We're going to play some stuff online, not show it on air. And here's a pity category for real. Ugh! Anyway, anyway, wow. uh, I also want to talk about before we move on to less happy things. Uh, what is, okay. I don't understand why Wolverine would regress to Weird Claws, and this is probably the least important story, but it bothered me all week. <laughs> he's had Bone Claws, he's been feral, the man has Adamantium Claws, it's important. Now he's getting white hot heat claws when he comes back from the dead, and I get comics are weird. I get that you can mm -hmm. do a story that has so many variations. of. Why would you do this to Wolverine? <laughs> why would you laser claw him, or whatever that's gonna be? I just, I saw the image and I was like, I wanted Wolverine back, and I've been appreciating the fact that you've given it some dignity of respecting the time we've had for Wolverine and the death actually meant something. Oh, you want to negate that? Okay, thanks. 
The goofy claws don't negate that. What? Oh, he's coming back with hot claws. He's got lightsaber claws. Why does he have six <laughs> lightsabers attached to his fists? Just read X-23. I have been. It's incredible. Tom Taylor, thank you. Also, X-Men Red, brilliant. Uh, both of those books, so good, and they are Wolverine. I just like, I love that when he died, it felt important. I love that as he stayed dead, it felt important. I love he's that been dead for four years, which by comic book standards is, is some time. And the Hunt for Wolverine books have been good to decent. Uh, so this image just was like, oh, oh no, no, no. Uh, what do you guys think about Hot Claws? I mean, well, I, I guess, you know, the, uh, the claws weren't quite strong enough to, well, no, that's not it. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know, man. I don't know. We'll, we'll see. I, I people think know. I'm a Marvel shill. I wanted to point out a folly in the House of Ideas. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah, it's like they already <laughs> could cut through pretty much anything and everything. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, hot schnicked. What does the sound? Yeah, hot huh? schnicked. Yeah. So I'm curious how they rationalize it. I just wanted to bring it up because uh, that was that was my minor mutation. Of <laughs> what? It's just an image. I'll I'll have to see them in action before I make up my mind. But <laughs> but it is interesting to see like they're trying something different. It is funny because he's been gone for four years, but we've also had old man Logan kicking around for a full mm. three of those years. And um, X23. And X23 as all new Wolverine. So there's not like a lack of this, <laughs> you know. Um, but I'm I'm happy to to have him back and see what happens here uh, with whatever's going on there. <laughs> Any other minor mutations you want to dive into before we move on? To um, you should maybe, uh, like, that. what was that Venom thing? Because you, you want to point people to it. Oh, yeah. this. Have you, did you see this? Yes. So yes. Todd McFarlane, who invented the look of Venom, Todd McFarlane redefined Spider-Man, Todd McFarlane did the rope webbing many people love. Todd McFarlane is an important piece of the fabric that is Spider-Man. Mm. Also, Venom looks like Venom because of Todd McFarlane. Todd McFarlane gave credit to the Venom movie, said he liked the look, and then he dove into what he would do to change the look, but with the caveat of, I love this, but I've got some time, here we go. Which I think is beautiful because it shows that artists are invested in this material. It shows that they're willing to look at things from an unbiased perspective, and there was no malice of, like, that's not my Venom, which I really appreciate because comics are very tricky with, like, ownership. So what he did was he got his uh, digital tablet, and he basically drew over the Venom image from the film and he did a side-by-side -side comparison of how his Venom would look had he done the design. And it's got more of a snout. Its eyes are different. There's more of a separation. He's got more of a nose. He's got like a little more animosity. And that way he's more expressive because when he smiles, there's actually a smile to go through. And I just really love that Todd McFarlane not only took the time but posted this because it just shows what the comic community can be if we all decide to get along. If we all decide that everything existing is a positive. That no matter mm -hmm. whether a movie's bad or not, it exists and that's better than we had in the 90s. No matter what, it's a good thing. So it's just, I've been the Venom cheerleader on the internet for the year. Uh, so it was really cool to see the guy that invented this character going, I too am excited, but this is this. And then at the end going, I love this material. I can't wait to see it. I just, I really appreciated that. So what do, yeah. what do you guys think? Yeah, well, he's, he's always, he was like an artist that blew my mind back in the day, you know, with how he would draw Spider-Man. Again, the, the, the webbing, but it was like the way that Spider-Man moved. Yeah. The way that he, you know, would, would contort his body and like that, that this knee would be up here, you know, and he's all the way down here. And I, I would just stare at it and stare at the details and the lines in Eddie Brock's face and, and, and the expressiveness of the character. So he's always been like an artist who um, I've loved. And uh, to see him sign off on it and then to just put his little spin on, you know, the, those little details that I love to look at, the teeth. Yeah. Even, you know, it was, it was just really, really cool to see him. Um, um, you know, give give the design team props and then just say, yeah, but, you know. Also, I can I this. Yeah. take this moment to segue to another artist that our audience might want to be aware of who well, is sitting at this table? <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> Speaking of comic art, I... Uh, <laughs> I do believe there was a Runaways announcement that happens yeah. next month. And speaking of transitioning from page to screen, You're going dude. the other way! Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've never heard of this happening. Maybe it's happened before, but you are playing Jeffrey Wilder on yeah. Runaways, and you are doing a variant cover for Runaways next month. Next month. That's so cool! Yeah. Scoops! Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> How did this happen? Um, uh, wow. Well, um... I think uh, we, one of our amazing producers, um, Emma, reached out to to Marvel, let him know, um, guys. I don't know if you know, but like Ryan Sands is a legit nerd, and he draws superheroes all day, superheroes, <laughs> superheroes and, and sneakers all day. And um, so I got a call from from Nick Lowe at at Marvel, who's the um, uh, the editor of uh, Runaways right now, and. He asked me, would I possibly be interested? And I'm like, possibly interested? What? <laughs> what? This is crazy. Of course I'm interested. Have you considered drawing for Marvel Comics? Yeah, would you... <laughs> 
possibly might back. maybe like as I'm like just knocking stuff off the wall because I'm like it's going right there in this frame. <laughs> so yeah, man, I'm I am I am like uh, like this this nervous about it. I, I just started working. I just started working on on the thumbnails and stuff. Um, so you know we're going back and forth and uh, yeah yeah. By the end of this week. We so, should be at a, at a good place with this Ride or Die comic fan, yeah. cast as a member yeah. of a comic, yeah. now drawing to physically be on the forever. You'll have a tangible piece of media at Marvel Comics. So let me get this straight. You really trying to make me cry right now, or is it... <laughs> Dude, the bar, yeah. man. That's I looked yeah. you up in, the, in the, the Diamond Comics distributor thing. I can do a search by creator name. And yeah. I was like, Ryan Sands. Oh, wow. And it pops yeah. up, Runaways uh, 13, I think, varying cover, um, wow. with no picture yet, because we don't yeah. know yet. Yeah. yeah, I love that, man. Co comic creator and comic actor, comic fan. I just oh, had to get you on the first show because I just I love that that happened for you and that someone that's so invested in the world gets all of that. Like that's such a beautiful thing that you've like lived it and now you get to live that love and actually have it like by this. Yeah, it's it's crazy. I got a I got there's a picture of like nine, ten year old Ryan drawing wearing his Hulk shirt behind <laughs> me in my office and you know <laughs> and really like that's where the, the picture of the cover is gonna go. Cause it's you know it it is really um um, incredibly humbling. I'm very thankful to to Marvel to give me this opportunity, and uh, yeah, you know, just hope hope we can just keep this thing moving. Yeah. Heck yeah, you can look out for that in September. A variant is an alternate cover, so the book will have a main cover by the fantastic Chris Anka, yes. who's been killing it on Runaways. Yes. Uh, and you can also ask your shop about the Ryan Sands variant. And also check out Ryan's Instagram for lots of awesome art and just keeping tabs. And I mean, it's not often you get to follow an actor that is also involved in the comics, literally. So <laughs> it's a it's a very cool it's a very cool thing. Uh, are there any other minor mutations we want to cover before we get to our pull list? You want to talk about some comics? I want to talk about some comics. Let's do it. While we're on the comic subject, let's talk about some comics. So we got a very fun pull list this week. I am very excited about all of these books, and I also now I get friends of cats because now I know it's not about cats. <laughs> uh, so leading the charge. We both put this on our list because this week, the Fantastic yes. Four are back! Yes. Dan Slott, Sarah Pacelli, Fantastic Four number one. I think it's Pacelli. It took me years to learn that, but it might be Sarah Pacelli. <laughs> Excellent news. I'm so <laughs> excited. Uh, I really think this book is going to change people's perspective of what the Fantastic Four are. It's going to clean up some continuity. They've been gone a long time. They literally get to redefine the Fantastic Four, which is amazing. And it's going to look incredible because she's an incredible artist. Mm -hmm. uh, we've The characters have been sort of around in different capacities. The book itself has been gone for just a couple years, mm -hmm. um, but that was a weird feeling because they are Marvel's first family. Yes. And as it says on the top, it's the world's greatest comic magazine. If you've been saying it since the 60s, you're just allowed to go on <laughs> It. Um, I believe that's the law. That's law. Um, it got grandfathered in from <laughs> grandfather times. Um, so yeah, we couldn't be more excited about uh, Fantastic Four number one. We'll roll through the pull list and then we'll do a, a commentary Great. on it. So what's in number two? Number two is a book I love. Amazing Spider-Man number three. Number three? Yeah. Number three. Oh, I thought we were just going to roll through. So. Oh, number three. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> uh, I was just like, yes, it is. Yeah, you're three. right. Yeah, Coy, three. That's correct. Yeah, yeah. He can <laughs> count. You put it on the list, Coy. <laughs> um, uh, number three is inc the other thing with much missed, much gone, Sandman Universe, mm. uh, which is uh, one shot out this week that is going to set up four new Vertigo books coming out soon. Uh, Neil Gaiman is spearheading this whole expansion of the Sandman Universe. I am individually excited about all these books. You're going to be hearing about them. Get ready. Number four is friend of the show and awesome human Mark and Draco's Supergirl. He's taking over the issue number 21. With Kevin friggin' McGuire. And, and covers by Dodson. Like, that book is going to be fantastic. And number five, so I can dive back to my Spidey. Yes, and number five uh, is, is, I picked a, a cover, but there's a co-lead. Uh, this is honestly our John Schnepp tribute pick because I know for a fact he would have been at my shop later to buy this. Hmm. The Jim Starlin Marvel Cosmic Artifact Edition. Mm. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about what those are as we get into what do you think of that pull list? So I gotta cycle back to Amazing Spider-Man number three because it ties into the first pull with Dan Slott. Dan Slott has been on Amazing Spider-Man for six years. Whether or not you saw that Spider-Man book as what it was, like people love that book or hate that book. That is a very polarizing book. Now- At least six. Uh, yeah, like a very long, yeah, at least six. So now Amazing Spider-Man is in the hands of the Invincible team and I love the art of Invincible. I I actually have never read, I'm going to say the it on air. The Art of Invincible. The Art of Invincible. Yes. Uh, the Art of Invincible. I've not read Invincible all the way through yet, so I'm actually 
actually starting that next. After I catch up on all my books, I want to know the glory of Invincible. So I'm loving the art. Uh, I think the book is fun. It's light. It's funny. It feels classic and new at the same time. It feels like the Spider-Man from the 60s, but it doesn't feel dated. It's a really, really fun read because it's like villains you know, but they're doing new things. So you never feel like you're like color by numbers -ing. And And the whole book just has this like splashy action feel and dynamic. And have you gotten a chance to read it yet? Not yet. It's like it's Not three yet. issues in. It's so lively and like it's I look forward to it every two weeks. Like I haven't had a book that I've been like fiending for in a really long time. And Amazing Spider-Man is that book. Have you gotten read any? Uh, no, I haven't said Dog with Spidey yet. It's so good. Interesting. Your recommendation of Ryan Otley is always good. Uh, I will. So, are you familiar with the artist editions, the artifact editions? No, these, no. Like, so I've, we talked about them a little bit on the show before. But IDW does a series of these crazy, huge, expensive hardcovers. Um, they are called. Most of them are called artist editions. There's also one out today that's a Kirby one. That's uh, in general, whenever possible, they collect entire stories of classic comic runs. Mm -hmm. But what they do is they only do it if they can find the original original art and then they they color copy them at the highest quality possible in the original size. So they're oh, huge. That's beautiful. Hmm. Like the Kirby one is like this, oh, the wow. Starlin one's like this because by the 70s they were working on slightly smaller paper. Um, they are very expensive, but they are this incredible part of comics history because you see the blue lines and the whiteout mm -hmm. and the notes that Kirby or whoever That's made amazing. in the margins wow. of the actual, like turning those pages, it feels like you've got the original art in front of you. And this week, not only is there a Kirby classic one out, but there is a Jim Starlin Marvel Cosmic Artifact. Artifact means they don't have the whole stories. They couldn't track down every page, mm. but they've got like as much as they could. Um, and you know Jim Starlin. We've talked about him on the show. You know him from Warlock. You know him from Thanos. You know him from Captain Marvel, the, the 60s one. Uh, just left, has is continuing to leave an enormous imprint on the Marvel Universe. Yeah. Uh, and you can go out and get that uh, for your extremely comically oversized bookshelf. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, at, at a store today. That will sit on the top of a bookshelf, just paint it out because it's giant. <laughs> Make it into a copy. <laughs> Was there anything coming out today that you had your eye on? I don't know if we checked with you on this. Well, um, Koi, we, we're, we're here, and I see why, because of the, the Spider-Man uh, connection. He, Spidey's always been my guy. Um, I'm a little behind with my reading because I've been a little busy lately. <laughs> but I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm looking forward to that, but, but I think out of that list, Seeing the Fantastic Four back has me really excited. Um, I've always been a huge FF fan. Um, I'm old enough to remember those reruns of the uh, old, old like '60s Fantastic Four cartoon. I was, nice. I was there in, in the Herbie years when uh, <laughs> they have the Human Torch. And um, yeah, yeah, I'm, like John Byrne's run of the Fantastic Four was like that was when I was old enough to kind of, you know, to really appreciate the storytelling. Mm. And, um, you know, of course I'm staring at, at John Byrne's artwork, but was really appreciating the the uh, the storytelling and that really cemented my uh, Fantastic Four uh, fandom. And yeah, it's just good to see him back. I've been been keeping up with the uh, with the torches and, and, and the things, exploits. The Marvel 2 and uh, ones yes, those are solid. Yes, yes, very well done. So yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. I, I, I've seen the uh, the redesigns for the new um, costumes, crazy. So yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, it's a big week. I, yeah. I think that all of these books are for different audiences or general comic fans. Like mm -hmm. if you like one thing, there's something for you, but also all of this is stuff for every comic reader. And that's yeah. really exciting because you can invest in a classic art book and that's like comics are art and I love that they're taking the time to make an art book of the actual size and see the art and invest. And then you've got a new creative team on Supergirl and Mark and Draco is such a good comic writer. He's so smart. He's so invested in the characters and I love the art. I think the book is so bright and poppy and exciting. And the more I get into DC, the more these kind of books can bring me in. And I've always been anti number ones, but I know that this is a new team. It can keep the number 21. I'm still buying it. I'm not <laughs> saying you got to redo the number every time. Uh, so all the books this week, I'm really excited for <laughs> And really, we, we are going to talk about all those books that spin out of Sandman universe, but it is so exciting to have that because Neil Gaiman, uh, the original writer on, on the Sandman series that we usually talk about, has sort of handpicked these four different teams to make four new ongoing books in the Vertigo universe. Um, so look to that as you're looking out for the DC Universe streaming services adaptation of Swamp Thing, uh, as you're looking at their coming Doom Patrol, look at the corners that come out of this inventive side of DC. Um, it's just really incredible stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, Twitter questions? Yeah, let's do this. Let's do it. 
All right, our first one is from Eric McGilvray at Eric McGilvray27. He said, hashtag Collider Heroes, getting to know the new host, Koi Jandro, and Enthusiami, Amy Dallin. Who is your favorite hero, favorite villain, favorite comic story arc, <laughs> favorite comic wow. movie? My answer, no, just real easy, easy breezy. My answers are Nightwing, <laughs> Two Face, The Long Halloween slash Dark Victory, and The Dark Knight. So I figured this was a good, like, it's our first show doing on this side of the table, and it's very short. It's real brief. Yeah, it's sure. just an easy, How did like, you do that in one tweet? <laughs> it's right. That's, that's the, that's the two, 280. This is for him. <laughs> so, uh, what, what are, actually, we'll start with our guests. What are yours? It's got uh, favorite, favorite hero. hero. Spider Man. Favorite, favorite villain. villain. Ooh, uh, Doctor Doom. Ooh. Ooh. Favorite yeah. comic story arc. <sighs> oh, <secret laughs> no pressure. You know what? Secret Wars is, is just, I mean, it's a time capsule for me, so I, I, that's always going to have a, a soft spot. That's the classic yeah. 1980 Secret yes, Wars? The yes. first Secret, giant yeah, Marvel crossover? Yeah. Hmm? yeah. And favorite comic movie? Man, Infinity Let's say two. War. Let's say two yeah. for... I'll say, I'll say uh, Winter Soldier and uh, maybe in Infinity War. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Amy? Solid choices. All right. Uh, let's see. Favorite hero... I'll, I'll change my mind day to day, but usually Kitty Bread. All right. Uh, favorite villain? <laughs> I'm terrible. It's forever, too. Because this know. is on camera. It's on so the internet. When this came through, I was like, this is going to be cemented for all times. So they can call me out forever. I will also change my mind on this day to day, but one of the all time classic villains, even though it's difficult to go back and read that book sometimes, Hair Star from Preacher. Ooh, okay. Um, just, just real, real bad. Uh, <laughs> Favorite comic story arc? That is literally impossible, but one of my favorites, and y'all have heard me talk about it on the show, is that I am borderline obsessed with Brian Vaughn and Adrian Alfona's Runaways. Uh, so I'm gonna throw that in, like that initial arc is just, just perfect. <laughs> um, although I also enjoy the transformations. Um, favorite comic movie is probably a dead tie between Avengers and Wonder Woman right now. All right. Uh, so for me, uh, favorite hero is Spider-Man, ride or die, always, I love Spider-Man, Deadpool, modern hero, like Deadpool's become my guy, but it's all because of Spider-Man, Spider-Man's my boy. Uh, favorite villain is gonna change as often as I flip-flop <laughs> between Spider-Man and Deadpool, but I love Venom so much because of what he represents, he is the id, the ego, he is the counter Spider-Man, there's so much to him, and if you write him right, that character is really smart and nuanced and has a lot of possibilities, which I'm still, still hoping. Um, uh, my favorite comic story arc... You know what? I can't have one favorite. I agree. Like, just pulling out one. Sandman. What was man? Everything. My favorite controversial one. So it's not my favorite. It's just the one I like to argue is I think the Clone Saga is good. It's not my favorite, but I think the Clone Saga has a lot of merits, and I think that it <laughs> is lighting. worth It's worth talking about. Wow. I think, they, I think the Clone Saga's got some merit. I think I've merit. heard that one before. That's, a, yeah, that's, that's why I'm dropping it. So yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start the conversation of I think the Clone Saga has a lot more going for it than people give it credit for. Mm. Uh, but I got to say, I really have been enjoying, like... I, it's, not, it's not also not a favorite, but Tom King's current run on Batman is so, like, a game changer. I, and favorite comic movie is going to be, I think, because it's so recent, but also because what it did for cinema. Infinity War really brought a universe together and gave all of those characters a lot of time to shine in a way that I didn't think was possible. And now, our very first, as co-hosts, sweaty question of the week. Uh, thank you to Cody Guest at Guest is the name for sending this one in. Oh, we picked another quick one, Roka. Uh, <laughs> what, are, <laughs> what are some good current comics for someone who wants to get into them but is really only familiar with the movies? P.S. Spider-Man is my favorite. So, I would say, as a Spidey guy, quickly, because the whiteboard of justice is up, um, <laughs> I would say Ultimate Spider-Man is a great gateway drug in a comics. Ultimate Spider-Man 1 through 6, if you only have 6 issues of time. Uh, 1 through 13 ideally, because issue 13 is the issue where he reveals to Mary Jane that he's Spider-Man. Spider-Man doesn't even show up in that spoilers. issue. Spoilers. Uh, yes, from 14 years, whoa, 16 years ago. Um, what it does is it doesn't have Spider-Man in the issue, but it shows you the power, the responsibility to Peter Parker, the relationship, the powerful writing, the beautiful art by Mark Bagley, it's just, it's such an important single issue, but if you're going to get into comics, I think that 1 through 13 Ultimate Spider-Man really allows you to see where the Marvel Cinematic Universe was born, what modern, like, comic storytelling can be. It's such an easy read, and it's so beautifully done, and it shows you a lot of the villains in new ways, so I, I think Ultimate Spider-Man. 
Uh, current runs, uh, you, if you are a Spidey fan, this is good timing for you because as Corey established earlier, there are only three issues into a brand new run on Spider-Man. Very easy to catch up there. Uh, I would also say if you just want to jump in and sort of get a feel for comics, uh, Justice League just started over with a new number mm -hmm. one, not started over story-wise, but had a new team come on. Um, so they're going, they're going big and, and crazy and the Legion of Doom has just shown up and, uh, and that's, that's only four or five issues in. Uh, there's a lot of sort of good jumping on points running around right now. You got any picks, Ryan? Hmm. Oh, Batman current. Hush. Is that current? Hush. Okay, yeah. current. Um, I'm digging uh, the current Captain America that has just uh, yes. just started. Tanahasi Coates is doing something, some some good stuff over there. Um, Only like two issues in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a it's a good time to jump in, and uh, it's very current and um, you know challenging who Captain America is now. Today, what does he represent now? Today, I think it's re really cool. Oh, and Steve Orlando's doing a run on Wonder Woman right now. That's super fantastic. Only the second issue came out, and you can look forward to G. Willow Wilson's taking over that book in a couple months, and I think that's going to blow all our heads off in a good way. And Batman Current, as I mentioned before, I think Tom King's Batman is, is so powerful, and it's Batman is smart, and the villains are used in really interesting ways, and it's 52 issues in, but that's not as long as a lot of other runs, so the current Batman, I think, is a really strong jumping on And point. very new reader friendly. Yeah, it's very, yeah, you can jump on issue one, and everything feels good, and I love the, there's a two-issue Batman Superman that taught me more about both those characters than I ever dreamed, because it's them talking about the others. Batman talking about Superman, Superman talking about Batman. Mm. Brilliant run. I think, right. that's, I think that's all of our stuff. We made it through. I think we did. Think we did Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much, Ryan, for coming and being our very first guest. Thanks for having me. Where can it's they fun. find you? Where can they find you on the internet and on the TV? At the Ryan Sands, pretty much everywhere, uh, social media and uh, Marvel's Runaways on Hulu coming soon. And pick up that variant cover because yeah. that's that's so yeah. crazy. Support a sweaty that made it to printing his actual cover. <laughs> you can buy tangible media. One of us is doing variant covers and playing a guy from a freaking comic. Wow. That's just, it's just you. <laughs> wow. you're, the, you're the Wikipedia category by yourself. <laughs> yeah, the Venn diagram, the center is just Ryan Sands going like, yeah, I'm drawing that cover. Oh, I'm all playing Jeffrey Weldon. That's it. Thanks, and guys. For, not nervous at all. Not nervous at all. For my co-host, Corey Jandro, and for me, Amy Dallin. You can find us here on Wednesdays uh, and on Twitter at Corey and on Instagram at Corey At Enthusiamy everywhere. And until next week. Until next week, stay, stay sweaty. sweaty. Hey everybody, Mark Ellis here. Thanks for watching this episode. You want to watch more? Then click up here. Or you can click right here for more great content from Collider. If you haven't subscribed to Collider Video, do so right now and share this vid with your friends. Thanks for watching.